how are you? What's news? What's how's twenty four going? Twenty four is um, following on nicely from twenty three. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we thought 23 was challenging, 24 is pretty hard as well, but feels like it's, um, I mean, we're still working through the implications of Philoxa. We're still working through all the market challenges. We're working through, um, you know, a whole heap of stuff. So I, I don't know. Sometimes I feel really positive. I'm, I'm optimistic about 25. That's probably so, a nice way to phrase it. I know we're always optimistic about the next vintage. If... Because in doing all the research for, for coming up with sort of like, you know, what to chat about, that was one thing that actually stuck out to me was because here in South Australia, like the words phylloxera are, are just so, I think even globally, the idea of phylloxera has, is just such a far gone thing. And I think a lot of people forget how much like phylloxera we don't have in say South Australia, but obviously in Victoria, it's very much present. How did that affect you? Because you say the effects of you're feeling the effects of phylloxera. I don't even I can't even empathise with that. What's what's going on? Yeah, I mean it's it's reshaping the Yarra Valley. Let's not understate it or underplay it. I think in terms of what you know, the Yarra was always a lot of small family owned operations, and uh, you see it from the hills where it's really. You know, people go up in a hot air balloon here, they're amazed how far apart vineyards are, how few there are, and typically how small they are. So mm. um, the fam, the nature of, of the Yarra has always been family-owned, small, you know, almost hobby farms, and the cost of replanting on rootstock for many is just too great. So right. and I think... I think the other part of that is while we're looking more and more at, you know, responsible, and I probably prefer the word responsible to sustainable in many ways, but, mm. you know, farming practices, um, and for us responsibility lies in dry farming and things like that as well. So <clears throat> I think it makes it harder and harder for people to farm the way they would like. Um, mm. You know, we're confronted by that challenge all the time. So it becomes, a, you know, a really interesting proposition. We, we were at dinner last night at the pub, sat down next to a couple who, you know, I, I didn't recognise, but they came out to spread straw under vine a few years ago when we were sort of at the point of, was, while you guys were going through drought, we were, you know, just <coughs> drowning in water and we couldn't get access mm. to sites and young vines were being overrun by competition and, so we're like, shit, we're the herbicide or we'll, we'll put the, you know, as the final call, we'll put out for volunteers and it was a 35, 40 degree day on a steep hill and we had, you know, all these volunteers come out because it wasn't about monetary gain. It was just, shit, we're, we're mm. in a, a you know, a, a regional setting and farmers are doing it tough and all these people came out and said, we'll help. A few people did leave at 11 o'clock and see the, the, the <laughs> dust as they took off down the dirt road. <laughs> But they, I sat down last night, like, how's the vineyard going? Did that straw make any difference? And uh, it's like, yeah, we, never, we didn't have to herbicide. It was, it got us through. Right. Um, so, yeah, I think it just highlights a lot of really positive things about our community and also just the challenge of, you know, would I, would I have, I, I came back to the Yarra in end of 04 and 07 was when the first detection of phylloxera was, was found. Mm. Was, were we bloody crazy to stay here in the Yarra? Should we have gone off to somewhere a bit easier? Um, what it has offered, and you're always looking for the silver lining, it's offered um, pretty amazing insight to old vineyards that have been pulled out with the assumption that every old vineyard's going to have deep roots. And then you look and say, see the impact of farming over a long period and why do some vineyards have amazing root systems and other vineyards incredibly shallow, um, and you sort of try to align that with what you've observed in its growing patterns before they got phylloxera. And do, do you find a pattern? Like, do you find, like, dry farm vineyards, like, that's the thing, right? Dry farm vineyards should, in theory, the root zone should be a lot deeper, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so soil preparation, even just looking, you know, even i have probably just become more observant about what's happening in, in general. Um, so we, 
sorry, in general, in terms of agriculture and, and other um, farming practices. So we've had some really, really wet years here, about five in a row. Um, looking at where gum trees just drop out, drop, fall over, and you think gum should have these amazing deep tapping root systems drawing every bit of moisture available. But if they're sitting in a low area where the water you know, sits, they've often got really shallow root systems and they'll fall over in a bit of wind, these incredibly old established gums. So just trying to see where water plays a significant role. Um, and I don't know, for me, looking at how we're building a resilient, robust agricultural system is probably becoming the number one objective and um, temperature and water are pretty key parts to that consideration. This, this sort of gets, I guess, further to the crux of um, like a lot of the, the questions that I had pertaining to sort of like your um, developing ideas around sort of viticulture because like you've moved to like organic management, you're moving to um, uh, like dry farming. And I think those, those things kind of lead into each other as well. Why um, uh, like Pinot and, and Chardonnay? Like is, are, are they not better grape varieties, more resilient grape varieties, or is it just like a really good site match there? Uh, I mean, I think in so many ways to answer this, because I think Pinot and Chardonnay obviously are the, the calling cards at the moment for a lot of people. And, but I think we do a really bad job representing those grapes in many ways in the sense of that true profile of what people are expecting. I mean, there's a reason we've taken the grape off the front of the label because we just don't want to underwhelm people. And if we're trying to represent place, even our own approach to those grapes, if we're trying to make Pinot and Chardonnay, I think we go about it differently to if we're looking at the attributes in the grape while dismissing what the grape variety is and trying to look at how to capture it. So I don't think our wines are pursuing the grape expression itself. I actually think we're, as a region, in the, well, probably as a country, our celebration of grape is potentially holding regions back from finding their potential, hearing what you're planting, you know, and just looking at what's happening in Europe all these established regions allowing more and more grape varieties into those regions to preserve their regional identity. Are we fixating on grape as the leader for a region or are we talking about style? And I think style is so secondary. And you look at, mm. uh, maybe it's because we're still trying to work out what our style is, but I think Yarra's got a great history of medium to light bodied wines that have, you know, um, amazing capacity to, to age, but a you know, lovely approachability when young and whether that's Cabernet, when we've got Gamay, Grenache, Menthea, Trousseau, like we've got a lot of stuff in the ground now. And you know, you're talking about putting Grenache in where you are. We're shocked at these 12% alcohol Grenache that don't look probably very Grenache-like, but they look very Yarra. And that's, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, so I, what does I, that I, mean for grape and if you're trying to sell Grenache? So people that don't know a lot about, you know, Grenache per se, if you put, and we had a chance to make some Grenache with Dylan Griggs for a couple of years ago, we released the Yarra and the Barossa side by side, sandy soil Barossa, you know, heavy clay loam Yarra. It's probably, for most of the market, it's a 50-50 split. But it's as a really... what they prefer. Yeah. And, but... Quite clearly, people who drink, you know, Grenache quite thoroughly, mainly out of Europe, will lean towards Barossa because mm. the context makes more sense. We've got a lot of whole bunch. It's really perfume. It's more of a, um, it's a slightly different approach with Yarra because we're conscious that it's coming in with a little bit of greenness in the seed. So there's less whole bunch. It's more of a, surprisingly, it's more of a dark cherry profile, quite spicy, but... If people aren't approaching it as Grenache, but as Yarra Valley or one of our mm. EBs, and just let's see what it's like, it definitely splits people, but the audience is quite different who gravitates mm. to what. Um, so, yeah, I'm constantly conflicted by where we sit with celebrating grape versus place. Well, I'm probably not conflicted. I'm just trying to make sense of what how we present it. And, yeah. we've, you know, we've intentionally... I mean, shit, I think I was lying in bed... At, some stupid hour this morning still thinking about this and 
pondering how lovely it would be to just make four wines <laughs> and just bundle it all together into a, you know, have it, it, you know, one Chardonnay. Probably be a much better drink if you're just looking at what's in the glass, all these elements mm. just slamming into each other and offering so much without having to think about it would offer so much more on some levels potentially. But I think, you know, clearly my motivation from day one was we're on land that we, you know, stole at some point. You know, we we farm it in a way that has affected the waterways here significantly. We um, It's just been not always through intentional disrespect, but the net result has been disrespecting the whole, you know, the whole system here. And I grew up on 50 acres out here and we, you know, we didn't detract from the land, but we didn't add to it. And we didn't understand it and know what to do. And Dad was a vet. He, you know, there was a lot of love as a starting point, but the final engagement didn't actually help. So, you know, then working in the Yarra, I still felt an amazing disconnect with really the land and, and what was my backyard. So it's only now through chats with the Indigenous community, thinking more broadly about farming, that I, I really like the idea that if we're farming well, farming grapes or farming the vines is just a small part of a bigger system. And the grapes are the byproduct, they're not the ambition. Mm. And if, if it's the byproduct and you're looking at what that it, it's a byproduct of, do you want it to be a byproduct of just a monoculture that you're controlling the whole, you know, the whole exercise? Then you then you feel like you're actually missing out on on the full picture, and the the risk is that the full picture is going to be so unrecognisable because you're incorporating so many elements that you haven't seen before that then you're left with the wine thinking shit. How do we sell this? Do you think there there is a way that we can farm viticulturally that does add back, that does regenerate? Yeah, I think 100%. Uh, and I think for the first time ever, you know, we're still doing a lot of things wrong. And, and going back to that, even that organic chat, and so Sam Middleton at Mount Mary, we talk about dry farming young vines. We've had a few years of just doing mechanical hand ploughing where needed around these young vines, stakes around it. We're losing so many vines. There's a couple of little sections this year that we are going to herbicide for new plantings because access, it's already too wet. And, you know, we're not using heavy herbicide chemicals, but we're in this really tough place where we can't have competition because we're not watering. We've done all this soil prep. But it's, it's a tortured state the whole mm. time. But so I, I want to be totally honest we're not you know in that sense where we're large parts fully organic but a couple of parts we're not um long to the goal is when everything you know we, we are going to get there for sure but um and we've had a few years where we've done a really good job but at, at a massive cost um but yeah can we get to the point where we're adding to the land health and condition 100 percent um mm. i think it's really interesting if you I remember going out to Corinder, which is the, the Wandon uh, estate here, amazing Indigenous history here that, you know, a lot of hardship and pain, but a lot of inspiration. And I remember being so nervous going out there for the first time. And there's this amazing oak tree in front of the, the, the flats down to the Yarra River. It's only a couple of K down the road. And um, I'm constantly looking at what they're doing. And they're talking about this visitor centre, and I'm like, shit, so you're going to have to pull this gum tree, this, um, this oak tree out, surely, because they're talking about all the restoration areas. And they're like, oh, we pull that out. It's a beautiful tree. And I was like, yeah, but, you know, it's a total acknowledgement of, of, you know, white settlement here. And they're like, yeah, but you're not turning back the clock, eh? Hey? This is who we are now. And it's a beautiful tree, and we have to just move forward together. And it's like this little pressure release valve for me, because, you know, I'm constantly thinking about recreating the past, which is probably, you know, which is obviously impossible and wrong. And we've got this amazing who we are now and we want to celebrate different parts, I think, of, of what we understand and what's always been here. But then, you know, how do we... So, you know, take the grapevine, it is introduced, but it doesn't mean that it can't work 
in a really vibrant, healthy system here. But mm. it depends what we do and how we treat that area in and around those fines. Do we wipe out everything else or do we actually look to build a far more complex system? So, you know, when um, when Dylan Grigg was living over here and we took over the, uh, an old vineyard in Westburn that had been neglected for 10 years, you know, the learnings out of a vineyard that has survived without any love, care or inputs was probably the most humbling, you know, farming experience I've had because everything we did we thought we were helping, taking more towards probably a monoculture, even though we're doing cover crops and things like that. It was still intervening and trying to control a set of, you know, um, conditions and it really had no impact at that point. The vines were so tough, you know, greater disease resistance, greater drought resistance, even though there was no irrigation. And so I think a lot of those observations feed into, you know, probably what we're trying to do now and how do we set them up to be more independent? How do we set them up mm-hmm. to be able to cope better? And a lot of that's to do with what are we planting nearby that helps lift the water table up or helps disperse water across a hill or stop it just running off? So, you know, cover crops are a really simple, you know, starting point in that. But I think it's a much broader conversation and a lot more exciting um, and fascinating. It's it's amazing. So it's for, for anyone watching this as well, this is actually quite interesting because we've not actually had a chance to even chat on a personal level really before we've bumped into each other I think once or twice but it's always been it's one of those things we very rarely catch up in our own hometowns we usually bump into each other in trade somewhere overseas yeah exactly the amount of people that have said brendan you absolutely need to talk to mac because literally everything from um not putting the variety in the front of the label i didn't even clock that one that's a huge thing for us as well i think as much as we have um, bragged about how Australia is, has, um, you know, simplified, democratised wine by, by doing it sort of varietally. We've done large swathes of damage by getting people aligned with a variety, not a place. You know, now, now it's like, it doesn't really matter where Shiraz comes from. We can plant it in the cheapest to farm places and irrigate the living crap out of it, get really good yield, make really good money. Uh, and now we're seeing the ramifications of that through the Riverland just because people were like, I, I'm a Shiraz drinker, not I'm a Barossa drinker, I'm not a, you know. Uh, and yeah. now the chance for Riverland to tell its own unique story is it, we're all working so astronomically harder these days to be able to get that message across. And so we took the variety off the front of label as well because I think if you make it about the variety, it becomes the variety. That's, that's the only thing anyone will ever see about it. Um, you know, our most popular wine, you know, Esoterico, we do uh, nearly 200,000 bottles of that. Um, it is a blend of Zabibo, Moscato Giallo, Gewurztraminer, Fiano and Greco, which I think if you asked any winemaker or marketer, how would you that sell this? Blend. <laughs> they would they would say, absolutely no way. Um, you know, but we didn't make it about the varieties, we made it about the place and the style. Um, and the same thing with the indigenous stuff. Could have just called like, it classic white. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, how do we degrade value immediately? Um, you know, but yeah, the, we, we, we had the same, a similar sort of experience with, um, with Applewood, the distillery, where we were te- speaking a very, um, a story we didn't feel we had agency over. Um, and equally, we sat in front of, you know, stood in front of our team and were like, how many Indigenous people do you have on speed dial? How many do you have in your phone directory? Um, you know, and resoundingly, I had a handful that I went to school with, and that's about it. And out of nowhere, um, a, a our bar manager, a guy, a lovely chap by the name of Wana. I, I just thought he had an interesting name. I didn't realise he was indigenous, and so yeah, he was okay. like, "I'm indig." Uh, and I was like, <laughs> "Serious? You've been here for like a year and a half. You didn't say anything." Uh, and he's like, "Do you want to do you want to go meet some indigenous people? Let's go." Uh, and so that kicked off this amazing friendship with the Gugana mob, which is. Like if you go out to Sejuna and then you drive north, their sort of area and land is um, on really that it joins Pigeon Jada, sort of the southern okay. part of the APY lands. And so every 20 weeks or so, we grab two trucks, six people, go off grid for seven or eight days and help them maintain their sacred sites and, um, and get to know the families. We've gotten to know the, we've been out five or six times now and it's, it is really grounding wow. how gracious they are with their knowledge, and it really starts to hammer home that like, it's it's not like you're it's not like a warring faction. It's not like they it's them against us. They're they're like, come on, like if you want to be a part of our culture, just help with our culture, 
and will immediately accept you. Um, it, it's actually we're not accepting of them. And yeah. I think when, when you sort of turn that mirror back on, on oneself, you kind of go, shit, like if we've missed this great opportunity for us to heal as a nation. But, and it's the same thing, would you believe this? There's also literally an oak tree on our property that were like, shit, we've got to get rid of it because it's not native. And they literally said the same thing. They were like, what, what's more destruction going to bring? Like, let's be pragmatic here. That, that's a hundred year old oak tree. Um, you know, birds live in that tree. Um, things live around that tree, things grow around that tree. We don't need to take it out to heal. We don't need to make more damage to heal. We need to be smarter than mm -hmm. this. Um, and I was like, shit. At first, it made me feel great about a 100-year-old oak tree because it's a beautiful tree. Um, but it really started to, to reframe, you're right, the idea of uh, do we need to go backwards to go forwards or can we just go forwards, you know? Totally. Yeah, I think most change needs to come from within us than trying to change external. And whether it's, I mean, you're, um, those comments align with what um, there's Joe Becker who does a lot of the zero waste and is I always find him, you know, so inspiring. But he, it's like we've got most of the solutions to all our troubles, you know, from our sustainability, climate. It's like but we've got to change our behaviours. It's all change from within. Mm. So we don't need new technology. And I bring that back to, is sustainability a luxury? And, you know, you talk about what, how expensive copper farming is, the reduced yields, all of these things that I think you've got to probably acknowledge um, to some degree. Um, so what does that mean? Is it, is it a luxury item or can sustainability be every day? And mm. I think if our consumption levels, and I think it's interesting when you look at global consumption right now reducing with alcohol in nearly every market, that can actually be a positive if it allows people to spend a bit more, drink a bit less, but, you know, so is it a reframing of, of what consumption looks like, whether it's, you know, textiles, clothing, you know, whether, like, our, our consumption of most things and how disposable we feel they are, it does mm. affect our industry as well. Um, yeah, I think it's bloody fascinating. It's um, the, the consumption thing. We were looking into some of those statistics recently uh, because we're, we're working on a bit of a documentary about like wine and health and where the status of research actually is and, how the, and also the, the quality of interpretation of data. Um, it definitely, I mean, there's yeah. no doubt that alcohol is, is lowering in consumption. But at the price point where it's lowering in is, is probably more fascinating. You would, you would expect always the, I guess, the more expensive wines to lower in consumption, and some are to a degree, but for the most part, it's, it's at the really cheap end of the spectrum, um, which means that the, the people sitting in the sort of premium price or just sub-premium price point are, are to a degree largely unaffected because a lot of these people are... Uh, uh, there is certainly a huge subset of people that are choosing not to have any alcohol anymore. But those that are, are simply moving to having more meaningful relationships with alcohol. Uh, mm -hmm. And of all the alcohols that you could have a meaningful relationship with, it's sort of the USP. It's sort of like the one thing that wine does really well. Um, more than pretty much almost every alcoholic beverage, I would argue. Um, yeah. And it seems that the value that's being placed on those meaningful relationships is being retained, which even makes it more important the, the telling the viticultural story, the viticultural aspect, I guess. How does that feed into, like, because you've always been, like, pro Yarra. Like, you worked overseas for a while, you did some vintages in Austria, Portugal. I know you've got a bit of a love affinity with, uh, is it Hungary as well? Yeah. Um, yeah, we ran into, I'm trying to get some wine apparently you're importing. You're importing this amazing wine producer that we, we bumped <laughs> into in, in Germany recently. Uh, with whatever the grape is, it just tastes like liquid happiness. Um, like, what's your relationship with Yarra in reference to, like, you know, everywhere else? You could have chosen anywhere to make wine. Uh, like, it wasn't a foregone conclusion, but it was a starting point. I, it felt unfinished. You grow up here, you, you feel you've been on the land, and, you know, like, like I said, never felt I really belonged here or deserved to be on here. But then where, where did I deserve to be? Be a lot easier to go and buy a small vineyard in the Loire and make shit and which you know would have made me very happy. But I just felt like it was my turn to probably give back a bit. 
and if we can, you know, add some. It's less about the wines, but if it was more about adding some layer of knowledge, recontributing to some of the knowledge that was lost, adding the right amount of respect to the land here, that I think, yeah, I just felt like it was my turn to, yeah, pitch a tent and and have a crack at it and see if it, if you know, if there was a story here. I, I mean, I, God, I've said this so many times, it's boring, but. I just remember going over to Europe when I started and everyone saying, well, your soils are too old, they don't have a story, the sun's too strong, you know, you just went through all of that. So I can't give you a lot of evidence to, you know, there's a bit of evidence, but not a lot to suggest otherwise, but we do have a story. And um, so, yeah, I think enough scar tissue accumulated that it was like, right, I've, I've got to try to have a go at presenting that. So. You know, going back to why Pinot and Chardonnay, there were Pinot and Chardonnay vineyards scattered around the Yarra, um, all because of, you know, I think going back to Shandon probably is where mm. every, every little family around the Yarra said, oh, if we put in some Pinot and Chardonnay, we'll be able to sell to Shandon. And so it made perfect sense to start with those two grapes as far as documenting differences in the Yarra. And that became the starting point. Um, but that was the... That was and still is the goal. Let's have a series of Pinot and Chardonnays, you know, across the region and let's see what, what the story is. Can we make sense of it? Are there real differences there? Is it just wine making? Is it just, you know, viticulture and less about soils? And, you know, I think the great thing is 20 years on, the, the soils are telling the story. And, you know, yeah, the story is getting stronger as we better connect with the places. Um, they're less forced. And I probably care less if people like or dislike the wines because the story's there and there's a mm. lot of good wine around the world. So, you know, the Yarra's not the best region in the world, nor is it the worst, but what, you know, what mm. defines the best region, it's not actually important. It's just it's mm. got a story that will resonate with some and not others. So where did Strasbourg Rangers come in? Oh, that's just one of the many contradictions, you know, meant to be about place and who cares about the grape, but... I love Riesling. <laughs> so, so that was just a self-indulgent. I think I was frustrated by the construct of Riesling at the time in the country and thought it probably, it, yeah, it was just exciting. And I thought a little side project of playing around with phenolics and sugars and whatever would be a really fun, you know, yeah, very self-indulgent part of, you know, this opportunity. And, yeah, so it sits a little bit outside the real core objective, but I think um, in a funny way, playing with granite and pink quartz and looking at those profiles, it's added to our understanding of the couple of little outcrops in the Yarra and what, you know, what working with different vessels like concrete in the cellar can do. So it's it's taught us a lot. It's a race to learn as well, isn't it? You, you're trying to cram in as much as you can without diminishing the chance to really dial in on a micro scale at the core as well. So mm. the fun, the broader elements and the, the sort of micro in the middle is, is sort of what we're trying to encompass, I guess. But, um, yeah, I mean, the fruit's so exciting up there that it's hard to try to talk ourselves out of it. Well, what, what, what learnings have you had regarding, say, Riesling that you feel that other producers at the time were getting so wrong? or missed opportunities? Um, and I think just the idea, and I remember people walking down to the cellar in 05, 06, 07, we were sharing a space in 06 and 07, and people come down and say, you can't, you can't do that to reason. And it's just crushing and de-stemming, no sulphur, putting it in oak, you know, nothing that wild, fermenting a little bit on skins. I think it's, you look, I look back now and I'm like, shit, a lot has changed in 20 years. It's a, you think it's a slow moving industry, and in many ways, it's incredibly slow. But what's a really comfortable conversation now for many people was mm. pretty uncomfortable for the majority back then. Because um, that was what you say, oh, your first vintage was 05. 05. Yeah. Then 06, so, and then 07, you had your own spot. We moved into where we are now. So, yeah, we were buying it. We, we had our own equipment and we were running as a sole operation from 05 but um, we had to move a couple of times. And then in 08, we moved to the, the premises we're in now. Um, 
But, yeah, I think I'd spent time working with Gruner and Riesling and just loved the how interactive with skins and phenolics it was. And I'd always seen that as a good way to go with whites anyway. Mount Mary was always crushing de-stem and a little bit of soak with whites. So I'd never been fully seduced by inert gas and a whole bunch mm. of pressing. Um, and so we do it with Chardonnay, we do it with Chenin, we do it every, with, you know, basically every every variety. Um, you know, super brown juice. That's why our mm. white's probably less fruity and quite waxy and, you know, um, yeah, so what was it, it wasn't a huge departure from probably what what I'd done historically, but to do it with Riesling was it felt you know a little more risque, I guess. What was the impact? Because like at oh five, oh six, oh seven, shit, oh wait, just trying to think. I think oh, I reckon I was like eighteen, mate. Um, the I was twelve. Na- <laughs> <laughs> the um, natural wine movement really sort of kicked off around 2010. I know because like the the three guys are all they all live around here. The what was the impact to you that you saw? Because you could you you're sort of like in a sense an innocent bystander because you were already on to a lot of those methods well and truly before they became kind of popularized. I imagine those early days people probably looked at you with you know an eyebrow raised, you know, employing these methods in the early days. What do you think the impact of that, and and did you get sort of rolled up, wrapped up into it as well? No, we've we've I don't think we've ever been in a camp, um, which is yeah, it's an interesting one, and that's across every market we've sold in. We've sort of just run our own race, which I'm you know long term I'm happy that that's the you know the situation. We've never, I mean, all we do is talk about what we do. And we're not, mm. we're not particularly, we've never sat in a classic Aussie, you know, profile. We've never, um, we've never sat in the classic um, natural, because we use sulfur. Um, so we sort of just keep, you know, dodging the, the, uh, the markers for any real label. Mm. Um, you know, trying to export wine when you're not natural or you're not classic Australian. Our best you know, success we've had overseas is being in a book without any other Aussie producers because if you're out on the road with any of Aussie producers, you're seeing people who are wanting to buy classic Aussie wines typically or classic natural wines and, you know, where do you, where do you sit? So, it's yeah, it's been an interesting... You know, if we're trying to make our life easy, we probably would have jumped on one of those camps and really pushed it. But mm. I guess we've just been trying to stick to the the objective of you know what are what are the differences across the year is the real starting point. But you seem to have been like I would outwardly say that you've been very successful in doing so in keeping to that. Obviously, it's taken a lot of time. You know, I think you know it shouldn't be forgotten. You know, now till you know 2005 till now, so, you know, a decent amount of time. I would throw you in with the producers like Peter Dredge. Pete Shell, you know, Spin Effects, yep. the people that have this. For me, I just say, like, these are people that don't make wine in any particular camp. They just make damn good wine, um, you know, and they're not stretching themselves and their total production levels beyond what their philosophy could actually, uh, uh, you know, achieve. Are there winemakers in Australia you look up to? Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, Dredgy, Pete, they're, they're great. And I, I mean, I love what Dredgy's doing in Tassie. I like, and I like the honesty. I think, hmm. you know, Dredgy talking about some of his Oregon wines and a bit bready here, or, you know, people who are just, this is the journey, there's some bumps in the road, you know, and we're not trying to sell an idea, we're just selling what we're encountering almost on the way, um, is really refreshing. So you can call them up and say, shit, what are we doing here? What are you doing here? And you hear all the problems and, you know, there's just a rawness to it all, which, you know, it's farming, it's, it's always going to be there to a degree. Um, I mean, Dylan Grigg and what he's doing with his Grenache, but more Dylan just being Dylan, um, good friend, so heavily biased there. Mount Mary's always a reference point just because, you know, I think I was there when it was wines on steroids and I guess that 
impression from John being, we're not going to worry about what's outside the bubble, we're not going to do things because it's on trend. If we're making any changes, we've got to be able to justify it to ourselves and better, mm. you know, make sure it's a change for the future that we're going to stand by regardless. So I think that mindset and being able to call Sam without, you know, without the irrigation, his set of challenges are very similar. What he's doing with root stops, you know, root stops that, you know, really do super well with irrigation aren't always the same root stops that do well in dry farming. So the resource pool of experience and knowledge is so much smaller in that sense that we're mm. trying to tap into. Um, so, yeah, I think it's just people who are trialling things. I mean, curiosity is the most appealing thing in this industry. Anyone that sort of puts their feet up and say, I've, I've worked it out, this, you know, it's pretty depressing and no one's worked it out. It's, you know, clearly too much bullshit if you think that. Um, so, I don't know, I think you're drawn to people who are curious because it invites more curiosity on your own behalf but also poses more questions or and sometimes answers that you're seeking out as well. Uh, have there been any sort of bumps on the road that have, have nearly, you know, shut up the whole thing, you know, absolute follies that you're like, shit, that we dodged a bullet there? Oh, there's so many. But I, I mean, I reckon 24, 23, 24 is right up there, just, you know, market forces plus the, you know, the commitment to replanting both other people's properties onto rootstock plus we've got a property injunction, Yarra Junction at the southeastern end of the valley and try to do it properly and plant other, you know, really set the, the land up properly. God, the costs have come in so much higher and we set all of those budgets up and I feel like, God, we've missed a few tricks on the way through. It's run it right to the wire. Um, you know, I guess I've had to find some peace in the idea that, God, if this all goes under, and I had, I said to my daughter a while ago, she got in the car and I was having a cry because I was like, she might have to sell our little property in Tasmania. And we we're going through the, the pros and cons. And I said to her, so if we'd gone out and just cut all the corners we feel we don't want to, and she's 11, or just turned 12, and they've been down planting trees in properties and, you know, try to share all the, you know, the whys. I said, if we'd been prepared to cut all the, the corners, we would not only be going on better holidays, we would also be probably keeping these properties without any concern. We'd be in a much better place. I'm like, but where we're at now, because we've chosen this path, we may have to sell Tasmania. And she said, right. And she went through it all and she said, oh, well, I guess if we have to sell it because we've done the right thing, that's that's the right way. And I thought that, yeah. that actually is, you know, if, if she's probably young enough to be so impressionable, but, you know, if a kid can understand that there's a cost attached to doing something, you know, there's a reason things are cheaper and easy and, and you know, that has its own implications. And if, so in a way, having the kids being part of that process and sharing where it's been hard has helped me because, you know, mm. they've obviously less, less in terms of responsibility to all the other people, which is probably what I get so caught up in. But it's a journey. Some things are going to be harder. Some things are going to test you. And if you have a set of beliefs that, you know, take longer, cost more, you know, certainly in the, the you know, first five to seven years of setting up a vineyard, that does have an impact. The market goes, you know, south and a few things all happen at once. Are you happy to live with that or can you live with that? Well, the answer is yes, I can. Wouldn't be easy if it happened and we're not, you know, planning for that to happen. But, yeah, looking down the barrel really for the first time after so much invested, it's made it a hard year for sure. It's funny that, um, you know, we've got a, a, a little one as well and even chatting to him, just the fact that kids don't have a fall from grace, you know, like the, they, they see yeah. the world in much simpler ways and, and sometimes that's a good thing, you know, to be able yeah. to simplify things right down. You know, I think when times are good, it's very easy to make, make smart decisions without making the right decisions. Um, and now we're sort of caught up in a bit of a turmoil of should we be doing what's right or what's smart? Um, mm -hmm. You know, thankfully, I feel we're choosing the right path, which isn't the most profitable one. But it's certainly the one I think that at the end of the day, you know, you can't, as my old man used to say, you know, you can't take it with you when you die, right? 
Um, yeah. You know, so the money to a certain degree doesn't really count. Um, it's just a means to do more stuff at the end of the day. And I look at it and you think, we've got the most, we, we've got, had a new staff member start this week and she rang earlier and said, I can't believe the people. She's like, they're the most, you know, passionate, most engaging, interesting bunch. I'm like, I know, we, we've never had such an incredible team as we do now. And that's probably the most valuable part of the whole thing. That, that, that I'll, I'll, like, for, for those watching this, there's, uh, I want to clarify that because that is, or confirm it, because we sent a young chap to you years ago, Conrad, and he mimicked the exact same thing. Uh, he loved absolutely every moment, um, you know, working with you on the team. And there was another guy that I used to study with, Sam um, uh, Baketa. Yep. You know, he, every single minute, every single minute loved working with you on the team. Uh, it really is something else that you've built uh, out the hour. And I think maybe it's because the environment, you know, the environment breeds, you know, eventually selects for the right team of people over the course of time. Have you ever had it's a, it's trouble sort of managing it? Like, oh, it's people. <laughs> um, yeah, God, farming's a lot easier than people, isn't it? Uh, yeah, of course it's speed. Super hard. I mean, the hardest thing is this industry is demanding. If you're asking people mm. to go out and hand hoe around vines, they're not going to do it because you're paying them, you know, a lot of money mm. or not enough or whatever. They're going to do it because they believe it's the right thing to do. So we've mm -hmm. got an incredibly eclectic bunch of people who are, I feel overwhelmed that they're so committed to something. Um, and prepared to go out and do really shit stuff. When I feel the industry, you know, we don't pay anyone, like we pay well over the award, but for the type of work that everyone's doing, which is far more manual than, you know, mm. it could be, it's far, you know, far more demanding than it could be. So people are here because they want to be. It's at times, you know, embarrassing, both for the industry that we're not able to recognise, you know, these huge efforts that people put in compared to other industries and what remuneration can look like elsewhere. Um, but also our funny little business, you know, has got this, uh, you know, incredible team. So, yeah, I don't know. I think it's just being honest. But my bad days, the challenge of the industry, the transparency we try to give to all of that, you know, good, bad, ugly, the whole thing. Like, it's a great industry and the ups mm. are so high and the downs are so down. But... If you can share it, and I, I don't know, I think that's part of, it's a bit like what we we're talking about as a business and our customers, what's our journey look like? Are we trying to say we're reaching a pinnacle or just let's see where this whole thing goes? It's the same thing, you know, with our customers, staff, whatever. It's like we're just trying to do, you know, yeah, do the best we can and, uh, and, and you know, everyone's invited to be along for the ride in some capacity. What? Well, it's sort of interesting you bring out the topic about the work that they do because you've got a bit of a different model to a lot of winemakers of your size. Like you actually run your own viticulture as well. Is that right? Yeah. yeah so so you've got your own team. teams that sort of like, do you lease plots or do you own the plots? So we've got uh, four vineyards we lease and one we own. Um, five, five staff in the team, our own equipment. Uh, so we do all our pruning in-house. Um, we really don't rely on crews until big picking days. Um, and that's, you know, been partly driven by phylloxera. If we've got crews coming through, it's partly just, you know, the more you do, the more you sort of see the standards you want to, you know, strive for. And you think, well, it's better we invest in people who are really keen. And it's also, for me, about the industry. If we just keep losing people to crews, and you know where automation's going and you think, where does the human element sit in this? Um, for me, it's a really important part of it, but we've got to invest in it and it definitely pays back, you know, as, as I see it. But our easily the biggest cost across the business by a massive margin is staff. Well, because I imagine it would be, like with five, that's a team of five, is that just for Vidi? Yep. Wow. And right now we got, wow. like, last year for a team of five, we got, I think, about 25 tonne because of all the replantings. 
our total fruit intake off our vineyards is 25 tonne. So that's... Dude. So we're buying in fruit at the moment to supplement while we're waiting between five and seven years to get our first crops off vines. Dude. I hear that. <laughs> you're that you're make making me nervous. <laughs> that makes me so, so that's nervous. why this year's been hard, you know. So what's the total area that you manage? Do you know that? Under vine, and that's changing all the time, but it's about 12 hectares. And are you paying for, um, like, the replanting as well? Yep. So you're paying... And we're Let, increasing the, the density. <laughs> so you're paying to put vines onto other people's land who already had vines on, yep. that they're leasing the land to you? Or we've leased a block in Don Valley that had nothing on it, and we put full infrastructure, 30-year lease, but we put full infrastructure in there. We're seven years in and we've so far got 500 kilos off four acres. <laughs> Deer, kangaroos, wallabies, wombats, hoke. It's now three <laughs> layers of fencing to protect that little block. It's the worst business model you can cost. Like if anyone wants to feel good about their situation with farming, give us a call. <laughs> Mate, I, I'm feeling great. <laughs> <laughs> So, because we did the numbers, and so we, we, we were looking around for a property because we don't, we, we, we uh, deal with growers who don't lease any plots. Um, and f we have 50 acres, but we specifically looked for that size because that would give us, or 25 hectares or 20 hectares or so, would, would allow us to be able to afford to have uh, basically full-time staff. So we wouldn't mm -hmm. be chained effectively to this one, one property. But you've only got 12 hectares and five staff. Yeah. And most of those hectares aren't already producing. Uh, I know that's under vine, but most aren't at full production yet. Correct. That's a, that's a really long game, brother. <laughs> yeah, that's why, so, you know, I think, shit, all this stress had better not shorten my life because I need to be around <laughs> to enjoy this. Well, it's funny. I was ch chatting to, the reason why I got in contact was actually because uh, I was chatting to Rajat Parr. And I oh, didn't yeah. realise that you guys have, have uh, a lovely friendship. Is he one of those guys that you sort of call up to kind of go <laughs> to feel better about your farming? Because I hear about how his farming goes and he lost <laughs> about 80% of his crop. <laughs> yeah, he's... I mean, he's a pretty interesting and amazing guy just coming in, you know, pretty late to farming and clearly has an amazing array of relationships that he just sucks dry for knowledge all the time. So he's applying, and he's finally planted his first vineyard himself, which he probably went into the eight by eight feet spacing, five foot high head trained, and trying to minimise inputs. And yep. so he spoke to a lot of people about how do you, you know, you can access them in either direction by machinery. He can run sheep mm. all year at five foot, you know, head trained. It means he can run sheep the whole time. He doesn't have to. Most that's that's a real high. Is that for frost or is that for uh, what's that for? He doesn't want to have to do mechanical work or herbicide. He just wants to be able to have livestock in there all year. Um, yep. So I really love the way he came at it. I'm still coming at trying to fulfil potential of a site. So he's taking his cordon up. We've done all our trials where we've now seen our cordon wires drop down because the fruit profile changes so dramatically even from 900 to 700 so all our new plantings are 600 or 400 and you think now we can't run livestock in you know the growing season we've you know we've yeah we we've done ourselves in there but what we're seeing in terms of you know yeah, I think for a lot of reasons, but we're we're um, we're seeing massive, in, you know, improvement in the plant's capacity to cope, but also fruit detail and definition and and the um, expression of a site we're seeing has just changed drastically through cordon height. So I'm so inspired by what he's doing, and yet we're going in the other direction. But it's that's what we that's what this industry is, which is so good. And it's, it's so complex, like just, just even considering, because I'm sure most people watching wouldn't understand like the implications of changing the height of, height of the cordon. But also simply once, once you, you know, you were just saying that what the fruit profile changes, you know, let alone considering changing the grape variety, 
which would have different proclivities to want to grow at different cordon heights, at different types of training, different types of pruning, the impact yep. of having livestock and therefore great um, carbon and nitrogen throughout the year. Like, it's just, it's so unbelievably complex. That it's overwhelming. Yeah, it, overwhelming's the best word for it. You, you can't, it's capturing storms and teacups. But, so that's where if, you, if we were just running a crew, there's no way we could execute all of these things we're trying to tease out. Yeah, right. So what do you pull your hair over, um, you know, and you have lo lovely luscious locks, mate. Um, you know, what, what, what causes them to fall out during vintage? Is it vineyard or is it winemaking? Oh, look. I love, I love vintage, you know. I think, I think drought without the water, without having a tap, that's where yeah. stress really creeps in. Um, but the change that we've seen when we've taken irrigation away, and it might take four or five years, but the way a site, going back to how do we see a site fulfil its potential, uh, our Ferguson property in Wurrialic is a great example. It had been not over irrigated, but it had been irrigated until about 2014. And by 17, 18, the shape of the, the fruit, tannin profile where it sat, all of these things started to change. And then you're also adding this element of phylloxerine and thinking if we're going to start with young vines again as a whole region, basically, do we want to be in a region where irrigation and is the number one influence on fruit profiles in that first five to 10 years. And it's great to get a crop in year three. Uh, trust me, I'd love to have that. But if it's shit fruit, that doesn't really speak of a place. Yet you go back and look at the wines from the 60s and 70s that were a dry farm, and they still drink well today, a lot of them, in the day they spoke so vividly of place. And yet people say, well, you can't do that today. The number one change has been the way we irrigate, or that we irrigate. Mm. Mm. So, yeah, I think. Um, so, so backtrack there. So, irrigating, uh, dry farming, young vines is what you're talking about. Yeah, we'll start without irrigation. What? <laughs> <laughs> As in, so you're putting, you'll put like a, a two-year-old vine basically a uh, like a rootling into the ground yeah and that's it gets a drink on the day in and we might go back with a water cart you know a couple of weeks later if we need to and you've done this already yeah i mean we've had some kind years um we've done a lot of soil prep beforehand with compost and so a lot of the money that would normally go into irrigation we've been putting it into other you know soil prep yeah um but they're pretty bloody tough. And so I suppose, yeah, you're right. So you wouldn't need, in terms of the cost of setting up sites, you inherently wouldn't need to run irrigation, pumps, bores. Um, it gives you great access to new sites that, do you need a water license there as well? To, like, to put in a vineyard? Because like, well, I'm not sure how it works in Victoria here, like water is sort of unbundled. So when you buy a site, it has to come with a, a license and you can't just, you can't bring water in onto a site and irrigate it sure. from somewhere else unless you've yeah. got the license to do so. But I suppose if you're dry farming. Exactly. Yeah, right. So how long, do, so I'm, it's now all starting to compound, isn't it? Because it's like I'm running, five, I'm paying five people, I'm farming 12 hectares. And you're not irrigating or fertigating to get fruit in your third year. So when are you getting no. fruit? It's probably closer to six years. <laughs> but seven to eight on other sites. But that's been yeah, influenced wow. by deer, you know, by, you know, deer, ruse, yes. wallabies getting in. So it's not just the farming practice in that case. Right, yeah, and they're obviously just, um, and I suppose that explains, do you use just big guards around, like, hanging off the Deer borderline? Deer fencing with skirts around the outside, and now we're doing an extra layer of bird netting around to keep, anyway, it's, it's yeah, it's fun. Wow, that is intense. So you wouldn't even consider, like, a light amount of irrigation in the early years that's, like, tapered off? Look, we've... 
So I, we have conceded on a little block that we've been struggling with. Let's put that in. It's destined, it's um, some Allegotte that we'll go into an EB to start with. But for our real pursuit of, you know, single vineyard this site, I think we've just got to do it the right way, and for me, the right way. And it's it's been proven, you know, Mount Mary's still part of mm. new plots, Sierra Crow and Yarra Yarra. It's not impossible. It just takes a, you know, a bigger commitment and a deeper pocket. I don't have deep wow. pockets, which is the commitment's there, but the pocket's not. <laughs> So I suppose, yeah, it's a, it's a time, money, energy and effort, which are like the three three elements of the algorithm of success, right? So if you don't have the money, it's the energy and the effort and the time that um, yeah. that you've got left to put in. Do you feel you've got enough energy? You've been going on for, a, what, almost 20 years now, huh? Uh, right now, it's the people that, you know, energise. And I think when these ones, even the 500 kilos of Shannon we got off Don Valley after seven years this year, it's the best barrel we've got in the winery, thank God. It, it's probably an will that be $1,000 a bottle? No, I think we just drink them ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> but in terms of, even for the team, you just see what one parcel of fruit can do for morale and the belief that this path is not just right in its principle of, you know, the bigger issues of water usage and what have you, but to see first crop that is so is so powerful in its messaging and the structure is beyond, you know, anything we saw from any, you know, bought in fruit, I guess. Um, to do that in its first crop, albeit year seven, um, was mind-blowing. And so everyone was straight away, right, let's think about next year, how are we tackling everything else? And um, understanding we're trying to run a business, I'm, I'm probably having to think more right now with, you know, you know, revenues down, you know, enough that trying to find that balance of we're running a business, you know, where where do we manage our costs and, and how do we manage those? Um, but also recognising our key blocks, this is what we can get, this is the effect that it can have and let's see what that, that story is. So we've put so much in, I feel like Ben Cousins talking about, you know, a six-day bender, why stop now? But it's like we've, we've been on this bender now for so long that to then turn around and say we're going to just irrigate and, and um, herbicide just to get through the next couple of years. If we've got to do it on a couple of blocks that we know aren't destined for single vineyard, you know, mm. we might look at that at some point if we have to. Or we might mothball a couple of blocks if we have to. Or, you know, there's things that we're conscious we might get to a point if... If we, you know, if we have to, but you know, we also know there's certain blocks that are just destined for, you know, whatever they're destined for, and we just want to be along for the ride. Well, mate, we're pretty much at time, and as as I predicted, we basically got through one or two questions max. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I cracked on a lot. No, no, it's good. It's absolutely, it's, every one of these happens the same way. Um, and, mate, I, I just honestly appreciate your time and, and sharing the knowledge. And, and to be honest, I uh, just appreciate the ability to actually talk to you after probably at least a decade of crossing paths and not actually having, uh, you know, to, to dedicate the time. Um, I, but, I mate, I'd love to be able to come out. I your farming too, and I love the fact that you're sharing all the hardships too because that sometimes makes me feel better as well. <laughs> Oh, good, good. Uh, I've got plenty, plenty more to come. Um, plenty more stuff ups and fuck ups. Um, I mean, yeah, I'm still learning how to drive a tractor. It's, it's. Uh, people keep telling me it's easy, but um, I'm not finding it as such. Maybe it's the type of tractor. Maybe I need to not have Italian tractors. Uh, <laughs> oh, we've got those as well. <laughs> uh, mate, I'm going to leave you here. Thank you so much, and Thanks. hopefully, see you out at Yarra sometime. Yeah, any time, mate. Good to show you around. Cheers, brother. Catch you soon. See you soon. Thanks. Ciao. Bye.